At first, I could see nothing. But presently, as my eyes grew accustomed to the light, details of the room within emerged. Strange animals, statues and gold. Everywhere, the glint of gold. With these words, Howard Carter described the greatest archaeological discovery ever made. Nothing before or since has equaled the splendor and magnificence of the tomb he had uncovered in 1922 in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. These stunning artifacts filled the tomb of Tutankhamun, an obscure pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. Until Howard Carter broke into his resting place, Tutankhamun was known only by one or two minor objects gathering dust in museums. Nothing like this. But from November 1922, his name became a household word. Tutankhamun was Egyptology. He also became the subject of a legend woven around a curse which was said to bring death to anyone who desecrated his tomb. Woe betide any grave robber or archaeologist who disturbed the 3,000-year slumber of the pharaoh Tutankhamun. Howard Carter had long been fascinated by the Valley of the Kings, a royal necropolis hacked out of the barren sides of a sun-blasted valley 600 miles up the River Nile in Upper Egypt, near the small town of Luxor. The valley provided a discreet cemetery for some of the best-known pharaohs of the New Kingdom, which lasted from 1577 to 1085 BC. Seeking security for their mortal remains and the treasures buried with them, the pharaohs were hidden in tombs hewn out of the harsh rock of the valley rather than under great pyramids of stone. Egypt's famous pyramids had proved rather too obvious an attraction for grave robbers. In 1914, Howard Carter began excavating the valley in association with George Herbert, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon. The Earl was an archaeological dilettante who spent much time in the warm climate of Egypt after a car accident left him in frail health. Carter was Carnarvon's field director, a stubborn, short-tempered, self-educated man who had first come to Egypt in 1892. Most archaeologists believed that the Valley of the Kings had yielded up all its secrets. But Carter was convinced that there were some areas which had not been subjected to systematic examination, as they were covered with the debris of previous excavations. Carter's hunch was correct, but he had to wait until the beginning of November 1922 before he uncovered the steps in the rock which were to lead him to Tutankhamun. At the twelfth step, he found a sealed doorway. The doorway had been hidden from previous excavators by the remains of workmen's huts erected during the building of the tomb of Ramesses VI. It bore a seal, that of Tutankhamun. Carter carefully filled in the entrance he had uncovered. He then cabled Carnarvon, who arrived in Egypt on the 24th of November. With him was his daughter, Lady Evelyn Herbert. The excavation was reopened, only for Carter to discover that the door at the foot of the steps showed signs of having been opened and then resealed. Had the tomb behind it been plundered? The door was removed, and then 30 foot of rubble left in a passageway to deter robbers. In the rubble, Carter found this exquisite head of the young pharaoh Tutankhamun. Carter now moved down the passage towards a second blocked door. It too bore signs of tomb robbers. He steeled himself for disappointment. With trembling hands, he made a hole in the door large enough to shine a light through. 
In a frenzy of anticipation, Carnarvon hissed, can you see anything? After an agonizing pause, Carter replied, yes, wonderful thing. The treasures in the antechamber uncovered by the two men were the start of a stunning process of discovery. As Carter and his team penetrated deeper into the tomb in successive seasons of work, objects of ever greater beauty were brought to the surface. But it was not until the autumn of 1925 that Carter came face to face with Tutankhamun. The body of the pharaoh lay within a series of richly decorated coffins, like a Russian doll wrapped in jewels and gold. Over the head, shoulders and chest of Tutankhamun's mummified body was a death mask of sheet gold. bandages were removed and Tutankhamun's face was seen again for the first time in over 3,000 years. Scientific examination of the mummy established that the pharaoh had died some time between the ages of 18 and 20. Professor Douglas Derry, who examined the body, noted a small scab by Tutankhamun's ear. The cause of his death remains a mystery, but murder cannot be ruled out. Mystery also surrounds the sequence of deaths which raced through those associated with the excavation of the tomb. There was a portent of disaster while Carter opened the tomb. A caged bird in the entrance to his house at Luxor had been eaten by a cobra, the serpent who spits fire on the pharaoh's enemies. News of the incident quickly spread through Luxor. Had the dead king's cobra vented his anger at the betrayal of his master's tomb? The first to die was the 57-year-old Lord Carnarvon. He did not live to gaze on the face of Tutankhamun. On the 6th of March, 1923, Carnarvon was bitten on the face, probably by a mosquito. While shaving in his suite at the Winter Palace Hotel in Luxor, he nicked the small pimple which had formed over the bite. According to one of his colleagues, an unspeakably filthy Egyptian fly then settled on the seeping spot and further infected it. Carnarvon fell ill. He was taken to Cairo, where blood poisoning and pneumonia set in. Lady Carnarvon flew out from England and rushed to his bedside. The world waited to hear the fate of the celebrated archaeological aristocrat. The novelist Marie Carelli issued a warning that the most dire punishment follows any rash intruder into a sealed tomb. Shortly afterwards, on the 5th of April, Carnarvon died. At the moment of Carnarvon's death, in the small hours of the 5th of April, all the lights in Cairo are said to have gone out. It was the first of several sinister events which accompanied his departure from the world and fueled rumours of the curse of Tutankhamun. At Highclere, Carnarvon's home in England, his terrier bitch is said to have set up a terrible howling when he died and then dropped dead herself. Some claim that the suppurating wound on Carnarvon's cheek was in exactly the same place as the scab on the face of the long-dead pharaoh. As he lay dying, Carnarvon might have reflected on the words of Arthur Wygall, an archaeologist long resident in Egypt, who also acted as a special correspondent for the Daily Mail newspaper. Wygall had told Carnarvon the tale of an earlier aristocratic archaeologist, an English nobleman who had brought a mummy to England. A series of tragedies followed. The aristocrat's arm was blown off in a shooting accident. His house burned down. His mistress was lost at sea. As Carter's team prepared to enter Tutankhamun's tomb for the first time, Carnarvon was in a jocular mood. Wygall, observing from the sidelines, half-jokingly told the travel writer H.V. Morton, if he goes down in that spirit, I give him six months to live. Half-joking or not, Wygall's prediction came true. Within six months of photographing Carter, bringing out the first of the treasures, Carnarvon was dead. 
even as he fought for his life, the newspapers were running stories on the curse of the pharaohs. But how mysterious was Carnarvon's death? His constitution had never been strong, and it had been further undermined by the excitement of opening the tomb. Nevertheless, the legend of the lights going out in Cairo when Carnarvon died was confirmed by the British High Commissioner in Egypt, the distinguished soldier, Field Marshal Lord Allenby. Allenby apparently asked the engineer in charge of the city's electricity supply for an explanation of the blackout, but none was forthcoming. Arthur Weigall, whose half-joking remark sparked the legend, was no friend of Carnarvon and Carter and strongly disapproved of their methods. He had another axe to grind. Carnarvon had given the London Times newspaper exclusive rights to the Tutankhamun story. Weigall, the special correspondent of the Daily Mail, was one of many disgruntled journalists trying to beat the Times embargo. His warning to Carnarvon probably owed as much to frustration as any belief in an ancient curse. Nevertheless, the suspicion that there was more to Carnarvon's death than a septic mosquito bite suited the popular image of ancient Egypt. It satisfied a deep-seated expectation of supernatural evil associated with a strange and distant civilization. One which by the end of the 19th century was being explored not just by archaeologists, but a new breed of wealthy tourists. Henceforward, the death of anyone even remotely connected with Carnarvon, Carter, and the discovery of the tomb was hailed as clinching evidence of the long arm of the pharaohs. There seemed no shortage of evidence. In September 1923, Carnarvon's younger brother, Aubrey Herbert, died suddenly after an operation to remove some teeth. An early visitor to the tomb had been Prince Ali Kamal Fami Bey. He was murdered by his wife at London Savoy Hotel. Carnarvon's secretary, Richard Bethel, died unexpectedly of a coronary thrombosis. His father, Lord Westbury, committed suicide by jumping from his seventh-story London apartment. At his funeral, Westbury's hearse ran over and killed a small child. Arthur Mace of New York's Metropolitan Museum had been Carter's right-hand man and present at the opening of Tutankhamun's coffin. His health broke down and he died in 1929. Arthur Weigel reminded Daily Mail readers that some very strange things have happened in connection with the Luxor excavations. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, declared himself a believer in the curse. Arthur Weigel was well aware of the legends surrounding the gods of ancient Egypt and the power they could exert on an active imagination. In the years before the First World War, Weigel had befriended an American artist, Joe Lyndon Smith, who spent a lifetime painstakingly reproducing the wall paintings in the temples and tombs of the Valley of the Kings. Smith was fascinated by the heretic pharaoh Akhenaten, who had attempted to supplant the cult of the god Amon-Ra with a new religion based on the worship of the sun. The headquarters of the priests of Amon-Ra were at the great temple of Karnak, near Luxor. After Akhenaten's death, they took their revenge. He became the ancient Egyptian equivalent of a non-person. Akhenaten was erased from official history, and a curse was placed on him, condemning him to wander forever through the afterlife. In the winter of 1907, Joe Lyndon Smith decided to lift the curse. He enlisted Weigel's help. They wrote a play, which they planned to perform in an eerie natural amphitheatre on which they had stumbled at the head of the Valley of the Queens. Smith's wife, Corinna, was to play the accursed Akhenaten, and Weigel's wife, Hortense, was also given a part. It all seemed great fun, but the play was never staged. On the 23rd of January, 1908, Weigel, Smith, and their wives gathered in the rock-bound amphitheater for a rehearsal. As the names of the ancient gods were invoked, 
the sky was split by a ferocious hailstorm, scattering the native servants. Worse was to follow. That night, Corinna was struck down with a terrible pain behind her eyes. Hortense was taken ill with agonizing stomach cramps. Amon Ra visited them in their dreams, striking the afflicted parts of their bodies with his flail. The women were rushed to hospital, where Corinna was diagnosed as having severe trachoma. Hortense underwent an operation which nearly killed her. Had the gods decided to remind these puny mortals of their frailty, or did the near tragedy have more to do with coincidence? Corinna had been complaining of eye trouble for some time, and Hortense was at the beginning of a difficult pregnancy. But the drama of these events would not have been lost on Arthur Weigall. And like any Egyptologist worth his salt, Weigall knew of the elaborate precautions that were taken to safeguard the dead pharaoh in the afterlife. The Ankh was the sign of life itself. Keeping eternal watch at the entrance to the boy king's tomb was the jackal-headed god Anubis, the ancient Egyptian guardian of the dead. One of the sentries in the burial chamber was the goddess Nephthys, with outstretched wings ready to enfold Tutankhamun. The lioness god Sekhmet and Jemisu, with his savagely hooked beak, stood guard. Protective formulae called on the gods to watch over the dead pharaoh on his long voyage through the afterlife. Hundreds of mannequins, each in Tutankhamun's likeness, stood ready to act as servants when the gods required him to perform a task. The pharaoh was also provided with personal protection. This dagger was found in the linen folds which swaddled the mummy. In the afterlife, Tutankhamun lived on as a conquering warrior. Although he had never drawn a bow in anger, his military deeds in death, once depicted in the tomb, assumed a life of their own. Could the pharaoh smite his enemies from beyond the grave? In 1934, the American Egyptologist Arthur Winlock disagreed. He pointed out that of the 26 people who had been present at the opening of the tomb, six had died within 10 years. Of the 22 who had witnessed the opening of Tutankhamun's sarcophagus, only two had died. The 10 people who had witnessed the unwrapping of the mummy were still alive. Howard Carter, surely the prime target for the wrath of the pharaoh, died of Hodgkinson's disease in 1939, at the age of 64. Hodgkinson's disease is a rare condition, and it is said that Carter died a lonely and disappointed man. But this 17-year delay perhaps stretches the curse too far. Harry Burton, the man who photographed every detail of the tomb and its contents, died in 1940. Lady Evelyn Herbert, Carnarvon's daughter and one of the first to enter the tomb, survived until 1980. Professor Derry, who took his scalpel to the mummy, lived to the ripe old age of 87. The curse seemed singularly selective. There is no shortage of pseudo-scientific explanations for the curse of the pharaohs. Journalist Philip Vandenberg has suggested that the tombs of the pharaohs were perfect breeding grounds for bacteria, which, over the centuries, could develop unknown and deadly forms, lying in wait for the unwary archaeologist. The ancient Egyptians were expert poisoners. They were familiar with substances which did not need to be swallowed to prove deadly. They could be absorbed through the skin. Wall paintings could be treated with these substances before the chambers in the tomb were sealed and made airtight. Tomb robbers always bored a small hole in the chamber wall before entering to allow fresh air to circulate. So did Howard Carter, but he pronounced Tutankhamun's tomb to be sterile. Another theory, put forward in the late 1940s, suggested that the ancient Egyptians protected their holy places with radioactive rock and smeared the floors with uranium. But the insect which killed Lord Carnarvon was not radioactive. 
Perhaps the most outlandish claim for the power of the curse concerns one of the worst disasters in maritime history, the sinking of the liner Titanic in 1912. Students of the incident, in which 1,500 passengers and crew lost their lives, know that the liner was lost on her maiden voyage after colliding with an iceberg in the North Atlantic. Those who believe in the curse of the pharaohs remain convinced that tragedy was ensured by the presence on board of an Egyptian mummy. It was the body of a prophetess who had lived during the reign of Tutankhamun's father-in-law, Akhenaten. An ornament found with the mummy bore a spell. Awake from the dream in which you sleep, and you will triumph over all that is done against you. One thing is certain, Howard Carter's sensational discovery acted as a powerful stimulant to the popular imagination. Hollywood loves a sensation and eagerly embraced the curse of the pharaohs. In 1932, the Universal Studio produced The Mummy, a horror feature in which Boris Karloff starred as a supernatural bandaged menace. It was the first in a long line of mummy movies. When the priceless treasures of the tomb of Tutankhamun traveled abroad, the public who queued to see them were as familiar with the legend of the curse as they were with the matchless beauty of the objects on display. Over 3,000 years after his death, Tutankhamun was big business. The security men closed the doors in the shadow of the Ankh, the symbol of life. Even in the jostling crowds, the contents of the time capsule which carried Tutankhamun through the afterlife have the power to take the viewer on a mental journey through time itself, just as they did Carter and Carnarvon over 70 years earlier. Their eerie beauty has the power to still even the most skeptical observer. In 1972, Tutankhamun's golden mask was created for shipment to Britain for an exhibition at London's British Museum to mark the 50th anniversary of Carter's discovery. The precious cargo arrived safely and was carefully unwrapped. The tension was almost as palpable as it had been in 1925. In charge of the operation at the Egyptian end, was 52-year-old Dr. Gamal Meres, Director General of Antiquities at Cairo Museum. He believed he was living proof that the curse did not exist. But on the day that the shippers arrived to remove the mask of Tutankhamun, Dr. Meres died of a heart attack. The death of Dr. Meres could be seen as another in a long line of sudden and sometimes spectacular exits by people connected to Tutankhamun. For those who believed in the curse of the pharaohs, it provided further evidence of the dangers of tampering with their remains and the relics which accompanied them on their endless journey through the afterlife. Could Carter and Carnarvon really have fallen foul of a curse? Carnarvon was indeed struck down even before the bandages were peeled from the face of the pharaoh. Carter, who always laughed at the idea, lived on for another 17 years. Was the legend the creature of Arthur Weigel's animosity towards Carnarvon and Carter? Weigel died in Egypt of a fever, a common enough occurrence, but one which earned him the honor of becoming victim number 21 on the boy king's hit list. Tutankhamun was buried over 3,000 years ago. It may be another 3,000 before we can bury the myth of his curse. <laughs>